my name is Anna Scott Maservi, and my story really starts in New York. I was born in Bridgewater, New York in Oneida County in 1850. I attended public school there until I decided to further my education at the Academy at Clinton, New York, and it was there I met Fort Dodge's native son, Stillman T. Maservi. Well, Still and I soon discovered that we were well suited for one another and we married in 1871. You'll have to forgive me, I misspoke. You see, my husband was not actually a native of Fort Dodge. His parents, the Judge William and Amanda Maservi, were originally from Illinois. Although they moved their family to Homer, Iowa, and then to Fort Dodge when it became the county seat. But since they were here from such a young age, my husband always considered it to be home. After our wedding at my parents' home, we traveled immediately to Fort Dodge, where my husband's parents threw us a beautiful reception. The Fort Dodge Times noted our 300 guest event, the merriment of our party with the house lit from top to bottom, and the generous nature of the gifts given to us, a solid silver tea service, a garnet ring and vases, and a very fine Bible, a gift from my mother. Well, as our life progressed, we were blessed with children, and our first son we lost in infancy. His name was Willard Scott, and you'll see his stone here. Our other children, William and Elizabeth and Scott, grew to their adulthood in Fort Dodge, and Elizabeth especially was blessed with many friends, and the paper often noted her comings and goings, especially when she wore a, a very fine black lace with scarlet roses to a party hosted by Miss Duncombe. Well, my daughter was not the only one mentioned in society columns. Once they interviewed a, a woman merchant who mentioned that whenever I came into her shop, she was always greeted with a smile and the kindest of manners. She went on to say that it must be very fine to be the grand dame of Fort Dodge. <laughs> well, grand dame I don't know about, but I do think it was sweet of her to say. If we um, experienced any social status, it was really because of my husband's natural head for business. He had a hard work ethic and good sense, which made him respected wherever he went. He, so socially, we enjoyed a very lively pace in Fort Dodge, and we owned one of the first cottages on Lake Okoboji. We vacationed on Fort Dodge Point with our friends the Cheneys and the Haskells and the Vincents. My husband um, entered into business with Mr. Vincent, who I understand you're meeting later today. And they, together they formed Maservi and uh, Vincent and Maservi Druggists, and they owned and operated it for many years, though it was only the beginning of their business ventures together. You see, in 1872, a year after we married, my husband and Mr. Vincent, along with George S. Ringland, formed the Fort Dodge Plaster Company. Later it became known as the Iowa Plaster Company. Their goal was to develop the manufacture of gypsum and eventually the production of stucco. They were very successful in this. Mr. Vincent once said that my husband had an intense loyalty to Fort Dodge and the kind of personality that made him liked wherever he went. And my husband certainly liked to be everywhere. He was involved in, in the bank in Fort Dodge. He was president of the First National Bank but he also had interests in, in railroad. He was instrumental in the development of a line between Fort Dodge north to Mason City, and eventually the renaming of a town. Maservi, Iowa is named for my husband and his brother who became very friendly with the people who lived there. Not only did my husband feel drawn to his town, but also to public service. Many times he served as city councilman, and he was three times elected mayor of Fort Dodge. He later went on to serve as a state representative for Iowa. And I really feel it speaks to his character and his political career that not only did he hold such offices, but that he was reelected so often. My husband wasn't the only one with civic involvement. I too was involved in the Ladies Improvement Society in town, and we were instrumental in bringing about a, a new park for the city, and as well as being influential in many other progressive in, um, projects in the city. We made our home at 923 First Avenue South, the site of what I understand is now Bruce Graham Funeral Home, and much of the house in its original intent still stands. At the time we built the house, it was 823, but a few years later they renumbered the streets. 
When our home was built, its three-story brick nature was hailed as a marvel of modern architecture. Outside the home is a fluted brick chimney. On the porch, gingerbread woodwork and soffits, but inside the home, I feel, is its true beauty. Fine oak paneling, seven uniquely tiled fireplaces, and a circular stained glass window up to the second floor, 63 inches in diameter and beautiful in afternoon sunlight. Well, you see, our home was often a site for civic events as well, and in 1900, we were thrilled to open our home to a very distinguished political guest. My husband's friend, J.P. Dolliver, arranged for Fort Dodge to be the first stop in the vice presidential campaign in Iowa for uh, Governor Theodore Roosevelt. And uh, Mr. Dolliver sent his wife this telegram the night before from O'Neill, Nebraska on October 4th. Notify Ms. Servi and Bennett that the Roosevelt party will take breakfast at Fort Dodge tomorrow at 7.30. The party consists of 20 people. Tell Ms. Servi and Bennett to have breakfast ready for three each at their homes. Governor Roosevelt Roosevelt will be introduced to the people of Fort Dodge at the Duncan House as he returns to his train. Signed, J.P. Dolliver. Well, members of the party breakfasted in the homes of our friends, but Governor Roosevelt breakfasted in my home, drinking from my own tea service and eating off my own plates. That morning, as Governor Roosevelt was going to give his speech, it was my husband who introduced him to the crowd of people. Over a hundred people gathered there to hear him speak. Some of the farmers from the outlying area came on horseback. And as Governor Roosevelt strode up to the house, he removed his Rough Riders hat in greeting to us all. And then Stillman introduced him as the next Vice President of the United States, which of course he did become. Well, shortly after that momentous occasion, my health began to deteriorate. Iowa winters had long been hard on my lungs, and usually as the weather improved, so would my health. But this time the pneumonia was too aggressive, and my health just not, my strength just not quite enough. I took to my bed on Thanksgiving evening, and I did not leave it. And on December 15th of 1900, I left this life. I told you that my home was now the site of Bruce Graham Funeral Home, and I think it fitting. You see, the first a funeral that the home ever hosted was my own. We were members of St. Mark's Episcopal Church, and so the Reverend C.H. Remington did my service, and the choir from St. Mark's sang. And the paper noted that white flowers graced my casket, reminiscent of the 50 white roses that adorned my table on my last birthday. My husband, true to his nature after my death, remained dedicated to the betterment of his community although he, he needed to leave it. You see, Iowa Plaster Company consolidated to form U.S. Gypsum Company, and my husband served on the advisory committee. They had their headquarters in Chicago, and though he left Fort Dodge physically in his heart, he never really truly left the city. He maintained residency here in Fort Dodge so that he could return to vote when, in, civ in city elections whenever he liked. And he continued to do this until 1927. On August 5th of that year, he died from complications with cancer. His final wishes were that his body be brought back to Fort Dodge for a funeral service at St. Mark's that the Reverend Stockley performed, and then burial here at Oakland Cemetery. Though my husband was once one of the most successful and wealthiest men in the county, at the time of his death, there was not enough money for a tombstone because of failed investments in Florida. Until last year. Last year, the Oakland Cemetery Board, local historians, and the USG Gypsum Company provided the stone you see here to honor my husband for his contributions to our town. Friends remembered us by saying that a society of a town takes its stamp from the people who make it. And when its leaders are showy or superficial or selfish, that the society of a town is apt to be such. But when its leaders are genuine, cultured, and unpretentious, that the society takes its color from them. And such leaders were Anna Scott Maservi and family. Thank you for coming today. Thank you. Thank you.